everybody. This is the Coffee with the Geek program. It is December of 2020. What a year. What a crazy year. Um, as you know, the secret to my success with the Coffee with the Geek program is I go on Twitter and I look who's posting really cool things. And then I contact them and say, hey, will you come and talk to me? And today's guest is no different. So uh, Sam Fesich, the uh, Dr. Sam Fesich. Uh, <laughs> You are from, you are a professor of education at Grove City College and author of Magic. You've got a few books on Magic, which we'll talk about. And uh, you're the host of the Magic podcast. That's a great title and great Thanks. name, should have thought of it. And um, let's just dig right into to the questions because there's so many good ones. And I know we can talk a lot. And one of the reasons just before I, I start asking, um, one of the reasons that I really was intrigued by by talking with you is, you know, it's been probably 25 years since I took my, um, you know, professional, <laughs> my, my <laughs> teaching classes. So yeah. I think there's been probably so much change. Maybe there isn't, maybe you'll tell me there isn't, but <laughs> I have a feeling there's a lot of change in, in teacher education. So it really fascinated me. I wanted to dig into to your thoughts on that because you're you're on the front lines of that yeah. so first of all let's talk coffee uh i have a, a peppermint mocha coffee always so special. jealous about that <laughs> <laughs> so tell me your favorite blend if you have one yeah absolutely so actually i have some coffee with me now um right now i have some pike place um but any other time fall season i'm a pumpkin spice latte fan all the way i try to get it until like beginning of August until about now they start to you know bring in that peppermint latte which is still really good uh but yes. yeah huge Starbucks fan and yes love the coffee have to do everything but first coffee and this case, <laughs> coffee with a geek this morning so yeah exactly so here. love it okay so now let's dig into the educational part of our Jesus. journey here so tell me this is a question I ask most people is tell me about your educational journey and how it got you to where you are today and what were some of your key inspirations yeah I'm happy to and I love how you frame it as an educational journey because I think we all come into education through different pathways and I like to tell my students some people roller skate into education meaning like they are born to teach they are ready to go some take like a back road you know like a little shortcut like oh I don't know if I'm gonna get into education but oh it's kind of pulling me here some people moonwalk into education but I feel like um, I've come into education in a pretty traditional way you know I, I went to college to be an elementary education teacher and I thought I was going to be the best the best first grade teacher this world has ever seen I have never taught first grade nor do I have a plan to um, but you know I, I went into undergrad thinking I was going to be an elementary education teacher and I remember one day very clearly my dad calls me up it was whenever we had flip phones you know they were cool back then and he calls me up and he goes hey Sammy um, I saw on the news that uh, colleges are now offering special education certifications. Does, does your college do that? You should do that. And I was like, dad, I'm 20 years old. I'm like, I know everything. I'm like, no, dad, I'm not doing that. I have to stay like an extra semester. That's crazy. But I ended up going to my advisor's office. I'm like, you know, I'm just going to add it just because. Well, one, my dad says probably be a good idea and he's paying for my college. So maybe I should do that. And second, maybe, maybe I might like this. I don't know. So I remember going into, you know, education classes and you learn all about the theory, the pedagogy, the methods. But what really hit me was whenever I went into my first special education classroom as an observer, as a field student, and I was like, oh, this is my heart. I need to be here. So Long story short, you know, graduated, got a master's um, in instructional tech and special education. And my first teaching job was in a multiple disabilities class of uh, middle school students in a school just for kids with disabilities. And I truly loved that teaching experience. I had about six adults and eight students in my classroom. It was 
an amazing experience learning with them, learning through them, and just seeing how technology can make the impossible possible for all of our students. And I was a teacher one day walking uh, down the hallway and a supply door closet was open and I saw a smart board and they were on wheels back then. And that was really cool. So I'm dragging this smart board out of the closet. And I was like, oh, I should see what this does. So I dragged it into my classroom. I did all the plugs and everything. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Um, so I got a training on it. There happened to be a training like in a couple of months at our local intermediate unit. I bebopped on over there, got the training and loved using the interactive whiteboard with my students. They were able to touch on their names, touch on their pictures and have things pop up, things that they enjoyed. But seeing that skills that they were able to do that I wouldn't have known if I didn't try out some technology first. And just seeing that blend between special education and educational technology has really led me to where I am today. So a PhD later and a certification later in instructional tech, I am now teaching future educators. I get to teach future educators at Grove City College. And it truly is an honor, a calling to work with them in, guess what, ed tech and special ed. So it's a a beautiful story and I love how that journey is just continuing to grow and I don't know what twists or turns it's going to make but I'm excited to be along along for the ride. So your dad's kind of suggestion was the isn't that crazy? <laughs> yeah. Listen to your just sparked it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so from your standpoint from a professor and student of student teachers and actually let me back up because you sparked something in me i just received an email this week believe it or not from an old student from my early days of teaching and it's always so fun to get those you know hey mr wheelock i remembered you back then and um and and i think back to my early days of teaching and i think how i was so passionate but i was so like I had so much to learn. <laughs> just, I made so many mistakes. And I we think back do. like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I did that. Oh, oh my gosh, I can't believe I said that back, you know, things that you wouldn't say or do or like all of those mistakes, but the passion was so intense then. So um, probably you're seeing that every day with, with the students that you teach, like they're probably super oh passionate, gosh. ready to go, but they and they probably think they know it all, right? Like we did. And we all did, yeah. right? We've all done, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Like I thought I knew it all and I knew nothing. <laughs> right, right. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, from your standpoint, what, what do you make of your students um, coming in and, and what's the state do you think of as, as education and these kids coming in and they're gonna, they're gonna take on the mantle from us eventually and just give yeah. us your thoughts from your standpoint. Sure. So a few things. Um, we are in very capable hands for that next generation of educators to come up through the ranks, get their degrees, because we know as educators, learning never stops. It doesn't stop when you cross that stage of graduation. It's just the beginning of your learning journey. And becoming an educator truly is an amazing calling to have. And we are definitely in capable hands. And I think this pandemic has truly made our student teachers who have student taught, you know, back in March and uh, throughout the fall. Maybe they did some stuff for the summer, but I really think it has made them stronger teachers. They've become more flexible, adaptable, using educational technology in meaningful, authentic ways to help support and grow their students and what they're learning in the classroom, whether it's a traditional learning space, hybrid, or virtual. And I truly think that these educators coming out know the importance of what an educator of excellence is. It's being that flexible learner. It's having that growth mindset, trying new things and reflecting upon what's going on in the classroom and what what your pedagogy, what your methods are. Is it working? Is it not working? Are my students understanding their objectives? How do I go back and reflect on that? Um, and just understanding the power of, of being a teacher and being that essential, that essential educator that everybody needs. Um, and one more thing, I also think it's important that as, as educators come into the teaching profession, we aren't changing the world. We are changing one student who may be the world to us. You know, so we aren't changing the whole world. We are changing the lives of, of students and they are, they are our world truly for educators. So that sparks something in me and maybe we'll, we'll blend that into some of the other questions, but I, I wonder what, 
and maybe maybe it's it's us in a sense are holding back some of the kids with technology. I think, hmm. and again, just from your perspective, I, I live in a college town. I know a lot of the college professors <laughs> here and I, I don't want to name names or point fingers or, or even, or even make accusations at, at all. But I will say, I wonder if, you know, with technology and specifically, and what we're seeing today with the pandemic and, and teachers really needed to, you know, latch onto technology really fast and some are really struggling and some are, are flying. Mm -hmm. um, do you think where we stand with ed tech, are we doing a good job um, teaching those young teachers how to be fluent in technology? I know they know how to use it. We always just expect, right. hey, there's a smart board, just take <laughs> off, right? Go do and, that. <laughs> right, <laughs> <Yeah>. right. <laughs> And, and I do think that today's probably student is more fearless with technology. They're not worried about breaking it, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, do you do you think maybe we're like, sometimes we're holding them back with technology, like we're not showing them the full power mm. because we don't know it? Um, I mean, do you, do you feel that way from, uh, you know, your, your colleagues? I mean, what is your sense just on a broader scale? Sure. So I think just like, we know as educators, learning never stops. I think even higher ed, you need to keep learning and growing. So whether that's getting connected with a PLN, um, I know I'm really passionate about getting on Twitter and Instagram and seeing what actual teachers are doing in their real real classrooms and bring that back to my students. I think the more we can reach into and see what teachers are doing in their classrooms and bring that back into our college courses, making it authentic and real for our students, making it meaningful, can only make them stronger teachers because I only know what it's like to teach special ed middle level. I don't know what it's like to teach secondary chemistry or first grade, but there are teachers around the world who do know how to do that. So connecting our students with educators that are just slaying in their field and just being able to bring those voices into our courses, staying up to date, bring in a variety of voices into our classes to help support, encourage, challenge our future teachers is something I think no matter what field you're going into needs to be something that you do at that higher ed level. So you're providing them with different perspectives, different methods, different viewpoints. Of course, all peer reviewed research based on all that jazz, but you're also providing them with connections to, to have after they graduate with other teachers from around the world. So I think as, as professors, we need to keep learning and growing, connect with our PLN, bring in those variety of voices um, into our courses as guest speakers or guest lecturers or whatever it might be. Um, but also being vulnerable with our students during classes. So for example, um, this semester I was doing a, a a unit on formative assessment. I'm like, hey guys, we're gonna, here's what formative assessment is. And here are four or three tools that I want you guys to check out. I created stuff from the student perspective so you guys can learn about it from the student perspective. And then you're gonna be paired up with a teacher and create content from the teacher perspective for that teacher to use in their classrooms. So at 7.30 that morning, I teach at 8 a.m. A colleague of mine, a former student, uh, shout out Derek Whitmer, um, he, uh, texted me on Instagram and he was like, hey, have you heard of this tool called Teacher Made? Um, if not, check it out. I know you're doing formative assessment this week. I think it'd be really cool. So I was like, well, sure, it's 7.30. I have a half hour. I could check this out. I ended up letting my students know, hey, so we originally had three choices here for this assignment. I'm adding in a fourth one. We're going to do a quick demo of it. I haven't you know, gotten too much into it, but here's how you use it. And giving them that that option to be to show them, hey, I haven't used this before, but we're going to try it together. Being vulnerable, showing them, um, we're always, even as as professors, we're still learning and trying new things in our classrooms. It's a great answer. So, kind of bringing a wide variety of experiences and knowing that you're not going to yes. know everything, and um, nobody can, yeah. nobody I does. Know. That's too much of a burden. Yeah. <laughs> So let's talk about your books. You've got a few yeah. out. If you could kind of walk us through the books that you've written already, and maybe you've got some future ones uh, coming maybe. up. And then maybe talk uh, about the content and who's the audience and 
all that stuff, yeah. right? All the details. Sure, yeah. absolutely. So my first book is called Edumagic, a guide for pre-service teachers. And I wrote it because I was finding there's amazing books out there for practicing teachers. There's amazing books for administrators. They're very like readable. They're not like a textbook. It's like talking to a friend over coffee, but I couldn't find anything for my future teachers to latch on to. So I was like, oh, I will do it myself. So I I just happened to be at the right time at the right place. I I wrote this book and thank you so much, Sarah Thomas, for believing in that message for future educators and having this this story go out to them. What's really cool about it, it's just like we're sitting down having coffee. Yep. Um, <laughs> yes. And Sarah's just, awesome, by the way. I, inter <sighs> I interviewed her a few years ago. Isn't she? Yeah. Hmm. I know. Um, yeah, so it's like we're having coffee and we're talking about things I wish I knew whenever I was a future teacher. So we talk about um, educating um, educating yourself so it's not just for the grade. Yeah, yeah, an A is great, but what did you really learn from that? What does that show? We talk about digital presence, professional learning networks. We talk about getting outside your classroom and your college and go do things like present at a conference, listen to a webinar, be a guest on a podcast, whatever it might be. Present at conferences, start an ed camp, volunteer somewhere, like go out and do things that will help benefit you as a future teacher and help you grow and learn because there's only so much you can learn from a textbook. Um, we talk about the importance of being an advocate for yourself in your education journey, um, being thankful, being grateful, um, those types of things uh, when it comes to being a teacher. And what's neat about it is sprinkled throughout the book are little snippets from future teachers and they share about stories or things that they learned about, um, advice for other future educators. And what's really neat is whenever I wrote the book, I was like, oh, it'd be, you know, it's not like a book that, you know, is required for classes, but hey, it's required for some classes in some <laughs> colleges. I was like, that's pretty awesome. Um, yeah. And so that kind of inspired um, there were a couple of students that I had that had, you know, written little snippets for the book, Hannah Turk, Hannah Sansom, and Katie Gibson. And when the book came out, um, about a few months later, they were all, uh, we were all at my house, they had graduated, they were all at my house, and we were getting ready for homecoming, um, for the homecoming parade to go down and see that. And like, oh my gosh, we should write another book for first year teachers, because we are first year teachers. Like, oh, that's a great idea. Didn't think we'd actually do it, we did it. And oh my gosh, <laughs> it was so much fun. And um, we wrote about expectations as a first year teacher, working through those disappointments, those bumps in the road, those pit stops that you're going to have, but they are pit stops. We just visit. We don't stay there. Uh, we talk about the importance of going beyond, um, going beyond your certification and continuing your learning and other areas of what that could look like. Um, so each, each book has E-D-U-M-A-G-I-C, and they all stand for something different, a different chapter in that book. And then those two things just kind of like happen simultaneously with the podcast and uh, the podcast is so much fun. I love um, chatting with administrators, current teachers, future educators. And yeah, it's just, it's just been an amazing, an amazing opportunity, amazing journey that just keeps, just keeps going. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That's really awesome. And Thank it's really you. fun to see how it, that just was, was organic in a sense. Yes. Yeah. And it's so neat to see how other future teachers are are taking what's what's in the book, taking what's in the podcast and applying it. I get tagged on Instagram. Hey, I had message. I checked out Jamboard. It was amazing. I'm like, oh, that's so cool. You go. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. So it's really fun to connect and learn with with other educators um, around the country, future educators and see to see what they're doing in their college courses and how they're rocking it every day. So let's blend that into the podcast. So you've Absolutely. got the Edu Magic podcast, and tell mm -hmm. us its focus and audience and uh... all the stuff. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> oh. sure. Yeah, so it's designed just for future teachers. So in this podcast, we talk about just recently. I had one about job interviews because uh, that's an important topic when you graduate. There's a whole series for student teaching, um, digital portfolios, professional learning networks. Um, when I first started the podcast, I was like, "Oh, it'll just be like 15 minutes. I don't think anyone's going to listen to it." And then, like, I got 20 listeners. I'm like, "Yay! This is so cool!" <laughs> and shout out to Chris Nessie from the 
Education Podcast Network and House of a Tech Podcast. He's like, Sam, you should start a podcast. I think that'd be pretty cool. I'm like, eh, Chris, no one's going to listen to it. He goes, uh, I think you should. <laughs> so I was like, okay. So, you know, uh, I think I had a conversation with him like on a Thursday. And then like the following week, I was like, hey, I got my first one ready. Let's do this. And he's like, okay, let's do this. <laughs> um, so it's... Um, I think it's up to like 104 episodes as of this week, 15,000 downloads. I am so excited. It is such a neat, a neat avenue to explore. And I find that I don't really like writing blog posts, but I can talk a lot. So that works out well. (laughs) (laughs) I know the writing process can be painful and time consuming. Yes, yes. (laughs) Yeah, so it's a lot of fun. I enjoy that. So thank you, Chris Nessie, for believing in that message and and putting it out there. So thank you. Well, and, you know, I think it taps into, uh, you know, our our creative side, too, using technologies for, you know, for for being creative, as well as just collaborating, connecting across the the miles. Right. (laughs) Cool. All right. So... You've, you spend a lot of time with, with young kids ready, <laughs> eager to go. What are your top recommendations uh, for them to be successful? Yeah, so something I wish that I learned when I was a first, before I began teaching as a first year teacher, I wish I would have done this in college. And it was setting up self-care and setting up boundaries, protecting your time for you. Because I was one of those teachers um, that would say, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll volunteer for that. I'll, I'll head that committee. I'll do this. I'll do that. And when it came to it, I was going into school like early and staying late and barely had time for, at, it was just me and my husband at the time, but, um, and then time for myself. So I would definitely recommend set yourself as a priority. Self-care is something that should not be like, that's self-care. No, it's self-care. And you need to take care of you so you can take care of others, whether that's your your partner, your children, your students, take time for you. And that's going to be a journey within itself. So for some people, that is like just getting out, taking a walk, going on exercising, or um, just sitting down for five minutes, enjoying your Pike Place while it's hot and doesn't get cold, right? <laughs> um, or your peppermint latte, um, <laughs> journaling, or reading, um, read, reading a chapter in a book, or whatever that might be, taking a hot bath, a glass of wine, whatever. But finding something that works for you and making it a priority, invest in yourself. That is something I wish I learned. I'm still working through that. Some, some days are better than others, but it's, thing, it's something that's still a journey that I'm taking that I wish I would have learned years before. So let me, let me run by my advice and, and you can see whether it, it's any good. Okay. Lay <laughs> it right. on me, what do you got? Right. So <laughs> I've always said to new teachers, there's, and this could probably apply to any kind of work environment where you're having to deal with people. There's, there's essentially three kinds of people. There's your energy. It's, it's like, you know, the electrons. It's, I go back to my chemistry days. It's like, you've got the, (laughs) the energy positives, right? Like, man, they're, they're, they're the best teachers. And they know when a kid's going to misbehave before the kid even misses behaves, you know, they're there, they're that, you know, pro and those teachers, those are the ones you want to seek out and, and, and find out what, what makes them tick, you know, like talk to them, get, you know, because most of the time those teachers won't seek you out, right? They're, they've got their own thing going. They're confident. Yeah. They know what's going on. Then you've got the energy negatives and the energy negatives are the, you know, the faculty room complainers, you Mama. know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes. they're the ones, you know, that, you know, talk negatively of kids and, you know, all the stuff that you were told not to do but they will usually seek you out, you know, because kind of misery loves company. They'll, they'll mm-hmm. usually latch on to that young teacher. And before you know it, you're in the faculty room and you're, you know, ah, rah, rah, you know, this, this, that, yeah. the other thing. And so I say like, avoid those teachers like the plague mm-hmm. because they Six will feet. want you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then, you know, then there's the energy neutrals, you know, there's the kind of, eh, they're, they're, they're the go along and get alongs. And, and again, it's a spectrum. Some days you can walk in and be that negative teacher, right? Like, oh, you know, I'm so mad at this, this, you know, and, and sometimes you can be that positive. But again, for a young teacher, it, you know, it's almost like, you know, again, in any profession, whether you're, you want to go and be an actor, like follow like the really good actors, like find out them because they're already got themselves established. They're not gonna, they're not gonna come seek you out, but they're the ones you need to follow. So 
Does that make sense? Did that? Yeah, that totally makes sense. And I think we can find those people in our buildings and online through our professional learning network. So go out there, find those shooting star teachers, connect with them, see what makes them tick. And I think you're gonna find that they start with relationships first. I mean, if we think about like awesome teachers that we've had, it's not that worksheet that they gave us, but it's how they made us feel. And I think going back to um, who went, I think Dr. Uh, Heather uh, Michelle mentioned uh, on my podcast a couple of episodes ago, she said, relationships first, procedures second, then content. So if we start with those relationships and really build that with our students, it's not just a first day, first week thing, but really getting to know them as individuals really can help our, our first set our first year up for success and then connecting with those educators I mean they're all over the place they're not just in your building they're all over online mm -hmm. and on blogs on podcasts doing webinars connect with them learn from them build that relationship with them as well that's a great uh, frame of reference and good advice really solid all right so Thanks. let's talk ed tech Let's so, do it. So, yeah. <laughs> what do you see as the latest and greatest? What's oh, what's going to be yeah. the, the frontier that we, the mountain we should be climbing right now? I have no idea. And when you, <laughs> when I looked at like, I don't know the, the next new ed tech thing, but I will say a couple of things that are really exciting that are getting me excited about ed tech is accessibility. And I know I'm going a totally different direction here, but oh my gosh, has accessibility been more important than ever, um, especially with COVID. And I want to give a shout out to a couple of um, companies that have really been doing a great job with accessibility. And when we think of accessibility, it's designing for all in mind first. Um, so, you know, we can save that teacher time. So using tools that already have built in content to help with that accessibility feature. So one of them is Microsoft's Immersive Reader, Holy moly, they really did a fantastic job. And yeah. this is a tool that I wish I had when I was a first year teacher. And this is something I show all of my students. I don't care when they take my class, they are learning this tool in ed tech. They're learning it in special ed. I'll even throw it into student teaching because, hey, you, you never know. And there's always updates being made. But text to speech, having that contrast feature, I can do dark text on a white background or white text on a dark background and all the colors in between. I can increase my font size, do, um, picture dictionary, translate, oh, immersive reader, A1 for accessibility. And then um, within Microsoft Teams, they have live captioning. So whenever I'm teaching, my students can just turn on live captioning. Because you know, sometimes I, uh, at a lecture while you're while you're listening to something, you might zone out here and there, but, <laughs> and or, you know, you might get muffled in the audio, but having that text being, um, you know, scrolling across the screen is so cool. Um, and that's available within Teams. And then PowerPoint has um, transcription available as well. You can just pop that in. You can even have it translate in while you're speaking English. It'll translate for you as well. And just the accessibility that I think um, the coronavirus, the pandemic has sh uh, not only shed light on ed tech, but also on the importance of making sure our students with special needs can access the content that we're providing them in this online space using tools like Immersive Reader, Google Read, Write, Think. Um, yeah, it's just it's just been so much fun to see what companies are doing and how they are um, helping all students be successful because these are things that help us too. You know, if we're um, cleaning up or doing some dishes, we can have a website read aloud to us instead of sitting down and reading. Okay, we have read aloud, which is great. We can put in highlights. We can put in, um, yeah, it's just, it's phenomenal. And I'm just so excited to see where we're going with accessibility. Yeah. And I think I agree with you. Microsoft really has been just pushing the boundaries of that accessibility. Yes. They've got so much power that are built into their programs and it's finally starting to show. Yeah. Uh, I talked to Mike Tolson a few uh, of him. <laughs> episodes ago and he, yeah, he, and it was just kind of, I was seeing it then, you know, like, wow, Microsoft is really doing it. And he had said, it's just a change of leadership. And the leadership said, we're going into education and we're, we're going to make it amazing. So, and they're, it they're is. really doing it. It is. Oh, I just wish they you know, Mike, you're awesome. I know. <laughs> he is awesome. Isn't he? I follow him all the time. Me too. I, uh, I sent out like a tech, you know, little blurb and said, you follow Mike. <laughs> like, you must like Mike. <laughs> 
he but, likes it, you know, you've got to be good. <laughs> But yeah, it's a lot of fun. I just wish they'd, you know, work on their naming a little bit, you know, like, yeah. like Apple has garage band, you know, it's like an and jam board, <laughs> Microsoft whiteboard. Let's jazz that up a bit. Let's add some sprinkles. I, and they can't get bubble. out of it. They're just nerds know, through and through. I they know. just, they're so stiff. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you mean. <laughs> yes. But Edge is cool. Edge is pretty trendy. Yeah, you know, that's yeah. pretty hip. And it's a great browser. It's my favorite browser now. It, Broke all the other ones for me. So. And you know, they have immersive reader embedded right within there. Collections Ooh, is cool. Yeah. It's not your I've been grandma's telling teachers, I know. <laughs> I've been telling teachers, go to go to Edge. Yeah. Do everything you want to. So it's where all the cool kids are. Exactly. <laughs> all right. Well, speaking of cool, here comes the speed geek question. So Let's we'll see it. how cool you really are. I'm not that cool. <laughs> <laughs> Neither am I. So we'll muddle through it though. All yes. right. So here we go. The first one, what's your favorite tablet? Do you have a favorite tablet? I don't have a tablet. I iPad, have, Chromebook, nothing? No, I have a Pixel phone and a uh, Windows PC. I know, I'm very boring. <laughs> <laughs> How do you like your Pixel? I had a Pixel, but I went back to iPhone, I'll be honest. And... You know, I never had an iPhone. Um, I always had Android devices. I really enjoy my Pixel. Um, what I really like, and I think this goes across all different devices, is the, um, well, there's accessibility, but there's also digital well-being options. So I can set timers. I can um, set timers on apps that I think I'm spending too much time on, which I love. And I can be self-disciplined and not up that timing a little bit, but it closes out like after 30 minutes. And then that's it for the day. I've done my social media. So like having... Um, across any device that you use, having those timers, I think has been really fun uh, for me for self-care going back to that whole thing. Got it. Okay, good. Uh, all right. First storage device. This is the, the age question without asking an age. Uh, I would have to say flash drive or no floppy disk, floppy disk. Yes. Using those in like middle and high school. And then the flash you drive got the floppy, really huh? Yes. Um, then flash drives are cool when they were on like that lanyard thing and <laughs> on. You remember You're... the zip drive? It had like a short little shelf life, but there was a thing called the zip drive, which was in between the floppy and the flash. No, mm. no, I don't remember. It was just like a big yeah. hard flash drive. And yeah, it didn't <laughs> last long, probably a one year cycle. All right. Like the flip video, which used to be really cool, like that flip video camera that had oh, like yeah. a little pop up. Oh my gosh, driving. I've got like I, I could, I've got like ten of them that are no longer useful, but they were yeah. awesome. But they were so cool. I love the color. They were. I know they were a really great idea. Okay, we've already talked about this one. Which what tech trend to watch for? But or or did we? What what would you say the tech trend to watch? Yes, yeah, so we talked about accessibility, and I would definitely say that again and again, because it's been an amazing transformation from design for this group of people, but now let's design for everybody, design with all in mind, and Microsoft killing it in that. Right. In that and realm, VR, sure. AR, you kind of mentioned that. In yeah, there. yeah, so AR, VR, I think there's some really cool stuff, definitely for um Google, Google Arts and Culture, they have some really cool AR filters we be, we worked with in our college course. We did, we turned ourselves into Van Gogh. We, we put ourselves in amazing paintings, but it brings that learning to life um, through the screen. So using augmented reality to help reach our learners in new ways and Google Arts and Culture is a great way to do that. Um, you know, QR codes and things like that, but just creating these learning environments that provide our students with different ways to interact with that content. All right, so this is going to be a big one and probably not one you can answer with just a one word or, or so. Okay. So um, if you could design your own school, what would, what would it look like? Ooh, it would have lots of windows, green space to play. Um, it would be open floor plans, so not a lot of desks, just comfy areas to, to sit and collaborate. I would say also have a Starbucks in there, maybe <laughs> classroom uh, yes and good oh, uh, music playing yeah. across the speakers <laughs> oh nice wow that was nicely defined it sounds like you've thought about this i have not and uh, that's the thing that came <laughs> out top of my head <laughs> all right so uh, that really concludes our interview um and i want to do one more thing with you and this will be sure. a practice i'm going to engage the whiteboard feature we're going to get crazy oh, here <laughs> do you see it and do you have your I pen do. tools 
All right. So um, see where my pen tools are. All right. Good. All right. So you draw something and then I'll draw something. Ready? Your turn first. Oh. Just draw any old thing. Okay. <laughs> All right. Oh, all right. Now it's, oh, <laughs> I put this, I put the smile on the wrong part. Erase. It could be a belt buckle. <laughs> all right. We try that again. Let's Go change it. colors here. There. Nice. So now it's your turn. <laughs> so I will draw. All right, your turn. Whoop, that was a little crooked, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> He's missing a tooth somewhere. <laughs> Here we go. Nice. Very Abe Lincoln. All right. <laughs> yeah, I'll let you finish it off. Awesome. Something like that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. We got it to work. Yay! All right, so I'll share this out with our, when I start Perfect. tweeting it out. This awesome. Work of art. <laughs> yes. All right, well, Sam, thank you so much. Sounds like you're doing great work. I'm going to keep following you on Twitter, so keep up the good work. Thank you so much. We just need to add a little cup of coffee to him and say, Coffee with the Geek is so much fun. <laughs> Ooh, love it. Ah. All right. Yeah. Oh, this was fun. Thank you so much. Thank you.